Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Hi, it's Jonathan Goldhill, and welcome back to another episode of the Disruptive Successor Show. Today, we're going to be talking about avoiding burnout and how to put your profit first. We'll cover other topics as well. My guest today is John Briggs, the founder of Insight Tax, based in the greater Salt Lake area. He's the author of Profit First for Micro Gyms. His theme is, as you'll see from his t-shirt, if you're watching this on YouTube, the IRS sucks, and business owners should keep more of their money to build long-term wealth. John battles against the traditional CPA culture of overwork, underpaid, pay your dues, and suffer while you're at it mentality by providing his team a healthy work-life balance, even during busy tax seasons. We are recording this in what traditionally would be the tax due date but maybe not in the state that you're based. If you're in California, for sure, you've been benefiting from the disaster relief and a delay in the taxes. But John, let's talk. You have some interesting ideas around avoiding burnout. Welcome to the show. I don't know, maybe you want to start with just giving a little bit about your background. People usually yeah. like to know who they're listening to, where they're coming from, a little bit about them. Yeah, thanks for having me, first of all. So, I have an accounting firm. There's 60 team members-ish. We've been growing steadily since day one when it was just me. As you mentioned, I kind of live south of Salt Lake and I got four kids. I have a master's degree in tax. Most people didn't know that's a thing, but specialized in tax. Sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, from BYU. <laughs> and I have been at this tax stuff for a good, almost 20 years now. So, John, question I sometimes like to ask people, and I think it's fitting, especially for a guy who's got a master's degree in taxation, is like, why? What's your why? What's Why do tax and law seem like two of the subjects that I tried to avoid gr growing up? They were necessary things you needed to learn enough about, but not so interesting that I'd want to become degreed at. What's yeah, your why no, I, in your business? I'm sure you've thought about th th talk about this in your own company. When it comes to the tax, I had a mentor in my early 20s and I suggest, I asked him, I said, look, you've known me now, like, what do you think I should do? Because at that point in my life, I thought I wanted to play video games for a living. And so I actually started college as a computer science major. Interestingly enough, though, after an entire year, not once did the professors assign playing video games as a homework assignment. So I was learning like C plus and Java and things like that building circuit gym like that. Yeah, I don't know if I want to do this. So I asked him and he's like, maybe something in business, maybe law. So it just so happens that both of those courses took me through accounting, the accounting 100 class. It was the first time in my life that a topic clicked. It just seemed so logical to my mind, which I know says a lot about me, but yeah, everything else, like I got good grades, but I had to work on it. I had to study. And while I still work at accounting, it's just, I don't know, it called to me. I'm like, this is what I need to do. And that's why I went down that road. And frankly, but an auditor, if you specialize in audit versus tax, you get paid more money, even if you decide to become an auditor, 
because you have a master's degree in tax. So I was like, cool, it keeps my options open. I ended up liking it. I loved the game. And then as far as the why goes, it I realized the IRS is, I don't know, a very powerful, incompetent bully. And I started seeing that as I got involved with taxes and dealing with clients and how the IRS treats them and the random letters they send to people. And most people don't realize that most of them are wrong, like the letters from the IRS are wrong. So then it kind of actually got back to my childhood where I was bullied by some neighborhood kids for just my family and some of our beliefs. And I realized I have a disdain for bullying and I want to protect people whenever possible. So that kind of led to where I'm at now. So did you experience the burnout that so many young graduates experience when they work for those used to be the big four accounting firms where they make you literally work 80, 100 plus hour weeks doing audits? Uh, Yeah. So I did a tax internship with Deloitte and I definitely saw that because the requirement was at least 55 hours and that's to keep the job. So if you want to stand out and be promoted above your peers, you have to put in more hours. So yeah, I was doing 75 to 80 hours. Now I was young enough. I didn't have a family and I purposely did it to make money. So I didn't mind the hours at the time. But then as my career went on and I saw that mindset in the accounting industry of, of course, you just accept the fact that you work all these hours. It's normal. Right. No, it is. It, who told you? Anyways, we're so convinced that it's normal it, and it's so far from normal. But then I was married. We had children. And I get the comments from my wife in the early years. Oh, just so you know, I'm a single parent during tax season. So that, well, that makes me feel great about myself and bringing a child into this world and letting you just go off on your own and taking care of it. And so I got to the point where I realized it wasn't a sustainable model for a happy life. And so from that point on, every time I brought in a team member and we grow, we've, we've done our best to keep the hours as reasonable as possible. And last year we averaged 42.6 hours a week during tax season. We're not quite done with tax season yet, but I imagine we'll fall pretty close to that. I'm trying to hit the exact 40. But that's really noble because for those of you who don't know, folks in the accounting profession, specifically those who are doing taxes, are working maybe 60, 80 hours a week, and then they might disappear for a few weeks after April 15th. Or a few months. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) There's probably some argument to be made for having a ladder due dates on tax returns. But I haven't seen anyone do that. They ladder it with corporate and yeah. S versus C and sole proprietorships. So what are some of the things that you do in your company or some of the beliefs that you hold to keep the hours down to a, a reasonable amount and avoid burnout? What are the things that some business owners might be able to think about in terms of their own businesses? The first underlying principle that I have is that I'm happy to give up some margin, some net income. Because here's the way it works in the accounting industry, right? And a lot of these industries where they're really just sucking the life out of people. Work as many hours as you can because their model is they know 70 to 80% of those team members are going to burn out and they're just going to replace with the next batch. So it's just, oh, you're an asset. Let's squeeze value out of you. You're paid a salary. The more hours I can get you to the work, the more profit and margin I now have built in as a company. I'm actually happy to eat into that because financially we are actually better off if I take less money now, but I have a longer tail because my retention with my team members is way better than the industry because they like it here. They know they don't have to kill themselves during busy seasons. And so they're going to stay longer and I don't have to keep redoing this cycle where I'm reinvesting and training new people. No, I'm training them. They get their client base. Now they basically are maintenance. Once they're trained, there's not a lot of involvement where we have to fix their work. They're doing a good job. The client relationship is there. So I found I'd rather create a cultural environment where people want to come in and I'm not putting their happiness in jeopardy 
yeah. just to increase a little bit of extra margin. Yeah. Let's talk about training for a moment because I think this is always a real issue for growing firms. I'm sure you work with plenty of growing firms, including yourself. Yeah. And there's probably some formulas that you have for training certain levels, types of positions. How long is it going to take for them to start producing at break even for the company, producing a profit? Don't know if you've measured those types of things, but any rules of thumb in your experience of how long it takes to get your the people in your business up to speed and working at either break even or at profit for the company? Yeah, so we've actually set it up because to, to me, the question is not necessarily how long does it take them to get up to speed? The question becomes, how do I get them up to speed by 90 days? Gotcha. That's the number I'm shooting for. Good. By 90 days, they need to at least be covering their salary. And if they're not, then they might not be a good team member for us. And so then if we, even if someone's starting and thinking about this, I'm doing it from scratch. I don't know if that's possible. That's okay. Set the goal, then have a debrief with the team member. It's okay. I needed you to be able to do X, Y, and Z at this point. And right now you can just do X. What got in the way? And then, so we did that cycle a few times and we have now built into our training system all the stuff they need to know so that they're doing enough by day 90 that now we're at least a break even. So that means all I have to do is commit to having the cash up front to cover 90 days of salary. And then at 90, they break even. So now it's not a further investment in the, from a company standpoint. I think that makes good sense. I tell some people that they should be showing signs that they could produce a profit, but in some positions, certainly maybe in some sales business development roles, it might be six months or it could be longer, which is a huge investment curve. So you have to have it planned out. You have to have a good onboarding program. I'm sure having 60 or more employees, you and I'm sure you've hired a lot more than 60 to get to <laughs> 60 employees. You've really had to refine that the onboarding process. Let's get back to the burnout talk concept a little bit more. I know you have some specific ideas and thoughts about how to avoid burnout. What are some thoughts that either you put forth in your own business or you share with your clients? Yeah. So let me start with a little quick story. So it's a made up story, supposedly. I don't know if it's true or not, but so they were out at this holiday dinner, but Easter just happened. Their family Easter party, right? Granddaughter's there and she's like, hey, First, she says to her mom, how come you're cutting off the edges of the pot roast? And the mom says, I don't know. Well, let's go ask my mom because the family event. And they ask the mom. So now the grand granddaughter asking the grandma and she's, I don't know. It just so happens that her mom is very healthy and has lived a long life, but she's also in the house. So now she's asking the great grandma, how come we cut off the edges of the pot roast? She says, because my pot roast pan was too small for the full roast. So we just had to cut off the edges to make it to fit. I share that example because sometimes we do things just because it's been done and we never stop to question why it's being done that way. I think our work week, the way it's structured is one of those things. Henry Ford popularized the five day work week, 40 hours a week back in the thirties. But yet we still do that nowadays, even though so many things have changed in the last hundred years. Science shows that the idea of sitting down and actually working for eight hours straight is not possible. Not to mention if you pulled people and if you look at studies, none of our employees are actually working eight hours a day anyways, because our focus is a muscle and it will give out at some point. Um, the science actually relates to the like continuous stimulus. So if you think about like our clothing, we don't really think about the fact of how it feels on our skin until we cause attention to it because our mind has been constantly stimulated with the shirt on that it stops registering it. Our attention is the same way. After a certain amount of time, our attention will go to something else. And one of the things that we do in our company is we try to encourage them to have short windows of attention followed by an intentional recovery period where they're not doing work stuff. 
So we call it the 3.3 rule. So work up to three hours and however long you work, take 30% of that time as a break. So the three is up to three hours. The point three is the 30% recovery period. And we find that we're able to get more done and we're more productive during those moments than we are just saying I'm sitting down and I'm working for eight hours. I like that. I think it's a creative concept and I can see how I've applied some variations of that in, in my own work life. And I know when I wrote my book, I set out, first I read a book on how to write a book and it set me out on a course of first map out all of your chapters, ask the questions that people want to know the answers to. So you basically have your outline. And it was, I think, A, B, C, D, all the way down to K, the different questions. I think, what is that, 13 different questions or something? And then some sub-questions. And then almost speak it or write it that way. Yeah. Now, when I sat down to write it, the goal was to write each chapter as fast as I could in, and finish in 50 to 55 minutes and use an egg timer to do that. And then get up for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And, you know, you couldn't do two or three of those stretches in a row, but that was the concept was like 50 minutes on, take a break, 10 minutes. Yeah. And I find that is a really good concept. Dan Sullivan, you might be familiar with yeah. Dan, I'm sure yeah. being the industry, he's the founder of a company with his partner, Babs, strategic coach. And he had the concept of focus days, buffer days, and free days. and really balancing the equation and free days would be days that you absolutely don't plug in at all. No electronics, no, no email, nothing. Focus days is where during the buffer days, you would plan that time of when you got into the zone or the flow that you would do that focus work. And I think that's another variation of a theme on how to balance productivity with life. So interesting stuff. Yeah, I think ultimately we need to be able to give ourselves permission to not feel guilty that we're not working eight hour blocks at a time or we're not working crazy overtime hours. That's okay. Because the reality is whatever you do, you need to be able to come back and do it the next day. Yeah. Because I'm sure you've seen this with business owners and your clients and we see it all the time too. These guys who are pushing themselves 10, 12 hours, the hustle culture, that spurt of energy will only last so long. Now, some people are driven, they're what I call uniques of nature, and they are capable of, for some reason, only getting four hours of sleep a night. Okay. But I wonder how much more productive they'd be if they got more than four hours of sleep and they didn't work crazy hours, if they're accomplishing so much. I just think it's those unique people that sometimes are the ones that are pushing this hustle culture idea. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I'm all about hard work. If you're sitting down and you're working, work, be focused. But, but you got to give yourself that cycle. But, and let's be clear. Like, I don't follow Tim Ferriss, but I did read his book, The 4-Hour Work Week. It was necessary reading, I thought, even though I didn't believe that anyone really could do a 4-Hour Work Week. Uh, although there are times where I wonder, because there are weeks where I don't work that many hours. But I digress. His 4-Hour Work Week to get into the position to be able to do all those, that type of work, it was four hours of real focus work. There was a lot of other time spent doing other things. And it's not really possible for most people to achieve a four hour work week without having already developed a level of success or systems in, and exactly. people in your business and where your systems business, and people. Yeah. Where you're an investor business owner as opposed to owning a job business owner. Yeah. It's funny you brought up Tim Ferriss. I actually went to a, it's called, it was called promote a book at the time. This was like 20 years ago. And the guy knew Tim Ferriss and they were at an event and Tim leaned over to him and said, it's crazy. I'm working 80 hours a week selling a book called the four hour work weeks. Yeah, exactly. And there we go. I rest my case. Thank you very much. All right, let's get, let's move away from burnout. But what I'm going to transition this as follows. You have put a structure in place, a concept, let's call it, which is this is how we need to work, folks. If we're going to avoid burnout, 
and maintain a high happiness quotient in our business. So talking about structures and systems, you've also put forth a book with a guy who wrote a book called Profit First, or at least maybe it wasn't written with him, I'm sorry, but you do work with him, Michael McAllowitz, who's pretty well known in certain circles. And he came up with this kind of profit first, which is pretty different from, from most people's thinking because, geez, that's the last thing on the income tax statement. The P&L statement is the profit is last, actually. Imagine if we put the profit first at the top and then set our goals out accordingly. Tell us a little bit about and what profit first is and maybe then we'll talk about how to apply it in our businesses. Sure. So Mike McAllis wrote the original book called Profit First. It's a great read. And from there, sometimes, so I'm a profit first professional. He allowed some of us, if we had a high concentration, a niche clients, and we felt the need that the system had to be tweaked, he let us write a derivative book. So I wrote Profit First for micro gyms. Micro gyms are the boutique, CrossFit, Orange Theory, Berry Bootcamp type of places, not the 24 hour fitness, not, no, not the, the different model. Yeah. yeah. Different model. And so when we talk about this concept, we have to first understand Parkinson's law. So the law states the demand for something expands to match the supply. So demand for something expands to match the supply. The way we think about it is think about usually the one bank account that businesses are using. That's a giant pile of supply. The demand to spend that pile of cash will continue to increase until there's no more money left to spend. And human behavior, that's just how most of us work. I think Mike in his book nicknamed it the bank balance accounting. Oh, I have money in the bank. Oh, there's a balance there. Cool, I'm going to spend money. And then you get the bill the next day that you already committed to. And it's, oh no, I just spent the money that was needed for this bill. Yeah. So. With the system, we say, look, we're probably not going to change our, the DNA of who we are science-wise. So instead of fighting Parkinson's law, let's just create boundaries and create a false sense of reality that we actually have less money to spend than we really do. So we say profit first. Yeah, Mike twisted the formula. So like the net income formula, right? It, we want to actually, instead of thinking about taking our expenses out of the income, we want to take our profit out of the income and then use what's left over to run our business. Um, yeah, so that's the general gist of profit first. And so just to go into a little more detail, it, there are set, so the money is set aside into a separate bank account and that's for a rainy day type fund type purposes, I understand it. Is that right? You correct me if I'm wrong. And then there's other bank accounts that you would set aside for taxes and another bank account that you'd set aside for just operating expenses. Yeah. So the main system recommends five for micro gyms, we recommend seven, but five bank accounts. So it's a take on the envelope method, but instead of using envelopes and actual cash, we're using bank accounts. So we have, we want one of those accounts to be our income account. Its sole purpose is to receive deposits. We want another one to be for pay. Because as owners, sometimes we neglect to pay ourselves. And guess what? You're the most important employee in your business. You should pay yourself as the most important employee of the business. So that also helps us avoid burnout when we're receiving something in exchange for the hard work we're putting in. So income, owners pay. You're going to be profitable with the system. So set aside money for tax. And then we want you not only to reward yourself for working in the day-to-day, -day, which is your owner's pay account, you also took risk as an owner and own equity in the business. We want you to get a return on that investment. And so we have a profit account for quarterly profit distributions. And then the last one is the normal account that people have, which is operating expenses. So when you pay all your bills out of. So those are the basic five. For gym owners, we added one of their top two expenses is team member expense. Uh, we recommend for them that they go ahead and set that aside. And then they have equipment, 
like their equipment is constantly getting used and basically broken, but they don't only have to repair it and burst. So we say set aside some money for that eventual day that you're going to have to buy a new bike or more barbells. So the two interesting thoughts that I have about this system is, first, this system was written for modern day times, not for people who grew up during the Depression or had their business during post-World War II when they didn't have credit cards, they didn't buy things that they couldn't pay for with cash. And a penny saved was a penny earned and they kept their money. So that I don't know if that's true, but it strikes me as those people didn't have the mentality that they did, baby boomers and the, everyone thereafter, especially where credit cards were rampant. But the second thing, and this is probably more practical question is, it's a lot of bank accounts to juggle money to and from. And you, I would imagine that when things are tight during the, especially during that early startup, which could be several years long stage of your business, that you're robbing from one bank account to another, constantly doing inter bank, inter not company, inter company loans, if you will, to try and keep the boat afloat and stay true to the system to the point where it might be very time consuming. It could especially be. Especially for micro gym owners who are probably yeah. not like the, they don't have a ton of money flowing through their business. What are your thoughts? Yeah, th the beauty is Profit First is a set of guidelines. It's not a hard set, like um, do this. And it's also based on percentages. So the first step of actually setting up a Profit First for yourself is to do an assessment. Where are you at? Mm -hmm. If you're at a stage, early stage, the percentages that you're setting aside for owner's pay is different than when you're a $10 million company. And as your income fluctuates, it's okay because you're allocating to these different accounts based on percentages. And so when it's actually being done, you're not robbing from one bank account to the next. Certainly there are scenarios where the client's learning how to do it. There's some tweaks that need to be made. But after a few months, you pretty, have the, you pretty much have the percentages dialed in. And it does. It works just as well for startups as it does healthy, mature companies, it really just depends on setting it up the right way and making sure your percentages are good. That makes a lot of sense. And I didn't understand or recall that part of the process, being able to test that and uh, like pressure test your business to figure out the percentages makes a lot of sense. What are some of the greatest challenges that you think business owners are facing regarding their finances? You're sure this is a, probably a this is probably where you get most of your phone calls, I would imagine. <laughs> it, there's a couple of things that come to mind, but ultimately most people go into business for whatever that product or service is, not to spend any time doing accounting stuff or managing their cash. Yeah. Because the, and it's a stereotypical way to look at it, but most entrepreneurs were very optimistic and I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this much money. As long as I make that much money, I don't even care about managing my cash because it's going to be flowing in. But then life happens and business happens and fires have to get put out. And without boundaries like the Profit First system, our expenses tend to increase the same pace as our income, if not faster. And so one of the challenges is how do they fit in some sort of element into their life where they're taking time to manage their cash? to look at their financial statements and to really just get an idea, where is my business actually at? Because the reality is accounting is a language and it's just a matter of learning that language, but it's not taught to the average entrepreneur or business owner. And most entrepreneurs probably never even took an accounting class. And at most they probably had the one and they were like, I hate this because they think accounting is debits and credits. But the reality is the accounting they need to understand is, my financials are saying this and I can now take that and correlate it with what actions I actually took and realize how my decisions are affecting income with also protecting themselves from that death spiral of yeah. like, increased income. I increase my expenses. Yeah. I think that, I think accounting is actually pretty interesting because I think that it gives you the, 
First of all, let's just differentiate financial accounting from management accounting, right? So financial accounting is what you do that is compliance driven, that is for filling out a tax return and, you know, taking the proper deductions. And that's all well and good. But management accounting is what helps you to make really good decisions about your business, helps you figure out growth rate, helps you figure out whether or not you've got room in your salary cap, if you will, to bring on another person. Yeah. It also helps you to drive, do benchmarking internally and understand your costs and how to drive efficiency and in labor and in, in production. So very different fields. And I just, I think the great disappointment for me with so many of the accountants that I've known and over the years is they get blinders on with either doing tax or audit work and they, they don't provide the strategic counsel that entrepreneurs need and look for. And I've seen many an opportunity where an accountant could partner with someone like myself, a coach, and we could do a quarterly review. We could benchmark if, if there's good industry data, if they're in a very mature industry. We could do extraordinary work around creating 13-week rolling forecasts and helping to drive change and helping them to figure out whether or not they can make key hires in management or in labor. Too much of that is just missing and is not taught in the accounting classes or schools that I've seen. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, you get the accountants where, uh, like on a tax side, you end up feeling like they're working for the government and not for you. Okay, hey, can I do, oh, you can't take that right off. Instead of asking, how can we structure that so that you can take a write off? Yeah. yeah. And the same with the accounting. Okay, here's your gap approved, government acceptable, or generally acceptable accounting principles. There it is. Okay, cool. But I can't use that to make decisions. Yeah, but it's pristine. It's, it follows all the rules. Yeah, that's cool. What about growing my wealth? So that's the focus that we like to take with our clients is everything that we're doing, how does this help our client grow their wealth? And instead of just, oh, cool, you're compliant. Yeah, so good. John, any closing thoughts? Any books that you're working on writing or anything that's up for you? Yeah, we have a, I have a book coming out in October. It's called The 3.3 Rule, where we go into the science of what I already shared about focus and recovery time. And then based on that, then it becomes the 3.3 system, which is you are effectively, if you let this happen in your company, your team members in an eight hour workday, you're only asking them to work six of the eight hours, basically. How do we make those six hours more productive than what they were giving you working a full eight hours? The rule of itself helps, but then it's what are things in the system about bringing in good clients or bad clients and how to go through that and training the team members and just all four sun fun things. So 3.3 rule, look for it in October. Sounds good. And you are one of how many certified profit purse coaches? Any, do you know uh, a large number? I, of you? I think nationwide, because they're international at this point, I want to say they have 400 across the globe. Right, a few, okay. I'm a mastery member and I want to say there's 80-ish mastery members. Okay. So, well, John Briggs, thanks so much for being on the show. Folks, if you're looking for a master certified coach in Profit First who can help you put Profit First in your business, you've got a resource right here in John Briggs at Insight Tax in the greater Salt Lake area. Also, obviously, if you're concerned about burnout in your own company, look for his forthcoming book. And folks, you know the drill. If you like this show, give us a good rating on your podcast listening app of choice and stay tuned for future episodes. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. 
Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.